Good afternoon, everyone. Um, today I'd like to talk to you a bit about argument diagramming, which is um, perhaps the most powerful tool that we use in core one critical thinking and communication. Uh, there are two main aims for today's presentation. The first is to show you how we actually teach argument diagramming in core one and use it to achieve uh, the goals of, of, of teaching students critical thinking and communication. Uh, to that end, I'm going to explain the challenges and context of Core 1, uh, just a bit about our unique situation. Also, I'll explain uh, and I'll actually give you an opportunity to have a go at some, one of the lessons that we, that we use in, in, in Core 1 to teach argument diagramming. Uh, but the second aim is to actually encourage you and um, your colleagues to use argument diagramming in your own subjects. Uh, I'm not an expert on, on any of the, the, the other subjects that you might teach, so what I'm going to do is show you eight ways that we use argument diagramming in Core 1 to meet the goals, um, the many goals of, of Core 1 to teach critical thinking and communication. Um, also, I'm going to finish up by giving you an actual lesson plan that you can use, say if you have debates in your classes, I've got a wonderful lesson plan that you guys can immediately use. Uh, to uh, give to the class. They already know how to do this argument diagramming stuff, so you'll be able to use this as well. So let me talk to you about the opportunities of the core program and Core 1 in particular. So every single undergraduate and diploma student at Bond University must take Core 1, apart from MBBS students. Uh, that gives us a unique uh, situation to... We've got wonderful challenges and wonderful opportunities. So. If you don't know much about what we're doing in the core program, I'll just, just explain a couple of things. So one of the first opportunities that we have is we, we're able to bring every student um, at once into contact with key university services. So for example, in Core One's first tutorial, we have Beyond Bond come in and students are actually able to meet in the first small group activity at Bond University. Uh, the very people who are going to be with them for the rest of their degree and then they get to meet the people who they'll be working with. Uh, we also link heavily with information services and I don't know whether, whether all of you know this but in the first week of Core 1 we test all students' uh, writing ability. We have them perform a, uh, a small academic uh, essay writing task. The, the tutors assess this task and any student who we think could benefit from the services um, that student learning support uh, provide, uh, we put them into contact with them from week two. So we put them into early um, immediate contact with people who can help them. Another set of people that we uh, work closely with is uh, our information services. So at a time in the course where students desperately need help in research and formulating an argument and, and supporting that argument, uh, we put them into contact with people from the university who can help them do just that. But we also have the opportunity to equip all students uh, with a shared set of skills. And that set of skills has to meet a few requirements. And this is a challenge for Core 1. Uh, one of the first difficulties is that these set, this set of skills has to be relevant and applicable to every program, and Bond University has around 50. So this has to, the stuff that we teach them has to be useful for people who are in film and television, who are in um, international relations, who are in biomedical science, who are in actuarial science. We, the things that we teach them need to be relevant to all of those degrees and applicable to all of those degrees. And also, transferable to many academic activities. It's no use just teaching them how to write essays because students do more at university and after university than write essays. Another thing that we have to do is we have to make sure that the skills that we teach them are useful for the rest of the degree. So there's a, there's a reason why Core 1 comes first and it's so that it can set people up for the rest of their academic career. So what I'm going to argue today, and what I'm going to show you today, is that argument diagramming provides the background, uh, the backbone, um, the core kind of, um, the core of, the core, uh, the core of these set of skills. But also, I'm going to argue another thing, that it provides a pedagogical framework for other subjects to build upon. So this isn't just a, an opportunity for the core, but this is an opportunity for Bond University. So. I'm in a situation where the students in their first semester uh, come into my class and I'm 
don't really know what their background is or their academic background is. They could be out of high school, they could be out of different high schools, they could be mature age students from industry. But in their second semester, we know something about the students then because of Core 1, and we know that they've got this set of skills. They're at least familiar with a certain set of skills, and one of those things is, and I think one of the most important things, is argument diagramming. So what is argument diagramming? Argument diagramming simply is um, representing the reasoning of, of an argument in kind of a visual format. That's it. Now, there's lots of things that that can mean, uh, but, but let me begin by defining this negatively. It's not a mind map, and, and students learn quickly when they use that word. Um, I get a twitch, but it, it's not a mind map. Um, a mind map is uh, just a simple thing where you show relationships between ideas. Here's, here's a wonderful example of a mind map. Um, the benefit and the pedagogical benefit of a mind map is that it, it, it allows you when you, when you represent the ideas, it gives you kind of like a bit of a brainstorming opportunity to add more to, uh, to those ideas and show links and those sorts of things. But the problem is, is that the links are very difficult to judge as being right or wrong or tenuous or weak or all of the things that we kind of need in a critical thinking class. And I, look, I don't want to um, kind of pick fights here with the mind mapping crew. But um, it looks in the top right hand side that to have a simpler life you need to break out of jail and steal a car. It's, it's unclear what this mind map means. Um, but, but anyway, uh, let me continue. Let me explain exactly the, the difference. In an argument diagramming, the links between things uh, are actually inferential. So that means that we're showing a set of reasons. We're saying that one thing is a reason for another thing. So we use an arrow to show the direction because inferential, inferential reasoning is directional. Um, and the arrow means simply that the thing at the top of the arrow is the reason and the thing that the arrow points towards is the conclusion. You read this simply as reason therefore conclusion or conclusion because reason. So let me give you an example. So I could say, my wife forgot my birthday, therefore I should get a divorce. Now, this can be right or wrong, because it doesn't make sense to say, um, my wife forgot my birthday because I should get a divorce. Do you see? Well, it might a little bit, but you, do you see that the, the, the direction is clear? And this can be right, this can be wrong, this has a particular order. So as opposed to an argument diagram, things can be wrong. Things can be weak, um, arguments can be strong, and we can criticise it with a rich critical language. Um, we, 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 we can look at the links and see whether it's a good argument. And you might actually think that this is a, this is a bad one. So one of the wonderful things about this ar argument diagramming is that it un uncovers weaknesses. You might look at that and say that, that that's poor grounds for seeking a divorce. So you might help strengthen it, and the wonderful thing about mind maps and argument diagramming is that there's still the brainstorming effect. So I could say that I will spend less time with in-laws, therefore better quality of life, therefore I should seek a divorce. And I can think about other reasons for better quality of life, more time for fishing, etc., etc. So this is, so the power that comes with a mind map, we still get it for an argument diagram, but, um, but, but the, the links are meaningful. So, let me go a bit into the history and types of argument diagrams so that I can explain why it is that we chose the particular type of diagrams that we use in Core 1. In a traditional critical thinking class or argument analysis class, what people will do is give you an argument and list the propositions and give them numbers, number off the propositions, number or statements or claims. And then students will have to work out, well, how are these arranged? And in this argument, I, I won't go through it, but one is the conclusion, and two and three are conjointly give, give evidence, oh, sorry, two and four conjointly give evidence for that, and three supports two. Now this is a very, very, very slow and um, kind of pedantic way to go through arguments. And another thing is that it isn't creative like the arguments that we use in Core 1. I'll, I'm just showing you that for a way of example. Um, now these things get quite complicated. So, for example, here's uh, a Wigmore chart. Now, uh, this is named after a famous uh, American jurist who, who would say that he could analyse, or who would attempt to analyse court cases. 
So you, you can see here that it becomes very, very, very complicated. And, and this is his way of, I think it's a murder case. Um, all of it seems to be pointing towards number eight, which is that this person felt revengeful, murderous emotion towards another person. And then there's the different types of shapes to represent different types of evidence and different types of argument. Very, very, very complicated. Another one that's less complicated, but still quite complex and a little bit beyond the ability of first semester students is, is what's called Toulmin's model of argument. Now, Toulmin, uh, to his credit, realised that in an argument there are different parts which are doing different things. So rather than dividing things into reasons and conclusions or premises and conclusions, um, there were certain roles that these premises played and, and he made a taxonomy because of it. Uh, th this is what, what he called a jurisprudential form of argument where uh, the, the warrant would be kind of the principle that the evidence or data would use to get to the claim. So very, very complicated. Now the good news is, is that Oh, sorry, some software has been developed to kind of handle this compli complicatedness. Um, for example, Araucaria, um, named after pine trees because of the branching nature of them, and, and Rationale, which is um, made by Tim Van Gelder of, of, of Melbourne University. But the good news is, is that all of these uh, types of argument diagrams, it's one of the main things that, that in the, the teaching and learning literature has been shown to improve critical thinking skills. And the great news is, is that pen and paper argument diagramming has been shown to be just as effective as, as, as all of these complicated methods and, um, and using software. And it's that type of thing that we're using in Core 1. So in Core 1, the type of argument diagramming we use is um, simplified. So here's an example of what students have created in their class. So the distinction is that we use kind of a shorthand approach to, to argument diagramming. And the focus, rather than on completeness and, and, and coherence, is that we're after speed and simplicity. So we want students to be able to get an idea of what they think very, very, very quickly. So instead of actually going through every single proposition that exists in an argument, we skip a few. And that's the main difference. And in skipping a few, we, 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 we make things a lot quicker. So how we do it is that we give uh, the students two instructions. We say, in order to create a diagram, you just have to ask two questions. Um, the first is why. Now, why is a wonderful question. Um, you can prod people with it. And what it does is it produces reasons. Um, it produces uh, evidence above. We usually start with the thesis. So if I was to give you the thesis, uh, dogs uh, are better than cats, and I was to ask why, you could say, well, there are guard dogs and there are not guard cats. Simple. The next question we ask is, so what? Now, what so what does is checks to see whether that actually is a reason for that conclusion. Um, there's two ways it, it might not be. First is, is if the link is incorrect. But the second and, and more subtle distinction is sometimes what students will do is jump to a conclusion. So when I say cats are better than do or dogs are better than cats and say that there are guard dogs and not guard cats, psychologically we think, well, that's a reason, and I would count that off in my lists of reasons why dogs are better than cats. But the beauty of argument diagramming is, is that we can actually find, by asking people so what, that the fact that there are guard dogs actually gives a series of reasons on the way to the thesis. So the fact that there are guard dogs proves that dogs can be trained in tasks that cats can't, which proves that they have more uses. And that's the thing that proves the thesis. Now, once again, we can actually use the, the brainstorming uh, benefits of argument diagramming to think of other things, like sniffer dogs, guide dogs, for reasons, uh, examples of things that can be trained, uh, dogs can be trained where cats, cats can't. We can think of other reasons why. Dogs are more useful than cats. Um, they're more likely to save you from a pool if you're drowning, et cetera, uh, than a cat would. We can't guarantee it, but, but it's certainly more likely. Um, so that's how we would support an argument. Two questions, why and so what. Then we teach the students, well, how, what about the other side? How would you refute an argument? So we get them again to list the thesis. And then in red, a different colored pen, um, to, to show 
distinctly what, what the case is against. Um, what's the other side? And the other side would be dogs are less convenient because dogs need to be walked, whereas cats do not. Dogs need to be cleaned, whereas cats can do that themselves. Then, if we were just to leave that there, that would be a, just a kind of a weighing up argument. So what we need to do is actually address these. And you, students will do things like this. They'll say uh, it's a positive thing that dogs need to be walked, and they'll give justifications. They'll say because it allows the owner to get fit. They might actually challenge, and this is a difficult challenge here, um, that convenience isn't the best measure of a pet, and I don't know how they would do that. I can kind of think of things. Um, but that would be one particular challenge that they could use. Another is they could challenge that directly by saying that, well, actually, cats are less convenient than dogs because they don't, or dogs are less convenient, more, anyway, more co convenient than cats because they don't trigger allergies. So that's how we do it. Now, what I would like to do is actually have you guys do an activity that we have the core one students do. Now, just so that you don't feel bad if this is difficult, uh, we, we take a while to get to this point in core one. In fact, we have five weeks of formal and informal logic just to teach people what that arrow means or what, what it means to uh, for the inferential link. So what I've given you here is a puzzle. And you need to work out let's say in two groups per table, if I can encourage. Um, can you guys at the back come forward and join Join in? No, not, not can you hear, can you join in? Uh, Beata, come on. So okay, now what I want you to do is work out how the puzzle fits together. Now we have a few rules, so everyone loves puzzles, but this puzzle has rules. The first rule is that remember that to work out how to get the answer of this puzzle, you're going to be asking yourself why, and your answer to that should, the answer to, the, so what I've done is I've separated these, this puzzle into propositions which form an argument. The ones above must prove the ones below. You should be able to read above, therefore, below, and below, therefore, uh, below, therefore, uh, sorry, because above. The main first step that you should be looking for, just to kind of kick you off on this um, <laughs> journey, is that you'll, you should be looking for a blue thesis. So I've got you an entire argument there that you need to work out how it works out. What's the main thesis? So can I give you some time to have a go at that? You guys look like you're enjoying yourselves, but I'll, I'll bring it to a close. Isn't this a wonderful activity, though? Um, so we give this to the students, and we give them a good 20 minutes, and they, they'll, they'll put out cards on the floor. It's all laminated. They get to, if, I don't know whether you were noticing the discussion that you guys had then. It was rich. It was, um, th there was argument. There was judgment. There was weighing up um, differences. It was a very, very rich, critical thinking kind of activity this was. I'll give you the answer, or at least what I think is the strongest answer. You guys may disagree. Um, so I think that the main points uh, that uh, we should, uh, for, the, for this argument, is that it would make society safer for the reason it reduces crime. It reduces crime for two reasons. First, it stops reoffence, and second, doing it acts as a deterrent. This isn't exactly what's written in yours. Um, you've got a more thing. It stops reoffence because they're dead. It stops, it acts as a deterrent because they fear jail, or they fear um, death more than they do jail. Now, the financial reasons are the other main consideration because keeping someone in jail, uh, the, this argument says, keeping someone in jail costs more than um, uh, killing them. Now, you, you might disagree with this. Uh, you might disagree with this argument. You might have a completely different opinion. But the power of this, of just seeing the argument laid out like that, you're immediately thinking about where you have a problem or what statement that's kind of there uh, that, that really bothers you and why it really bothers you. And that's the beauty of argument diagramming. It shows the working for an opinion. And, and it tells students that they need to show their working for an opinion. Far too often we'll have students uh, focus too much on their answer, whereas in reality we don't care too much about their answer. We care about how they got there. All right. So what can we use this for? So all of these skills, and, and, and we, teach, we teach them different um, students different ways 
to develop these skills, this is just one activity. Another one is where they create their own argument. Um, so it's not rearranging these things that are already prepackaged. It's, 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 it's creative, and then we talk it through. Um, but how can we use these? Again, I'm just going to talk about eight ways that we use them in core, this skill, that same skill that you guys were practicing then um, in core one to increase critical thinking. And these are them. I'll just talk to them uh, one by one. The first is working out what goes into a paragraph. Uh, that might seem like it's a very, very easy question for you guys, but uh, for first semester students, and you might have met some <laughs> subsequent semester students, they'll come to you and say, what should be in a paragraph? And there's often some mnemonics that are made about it. It needs a topic sentence, a linking sentence, some evidence, and stuff like that. And they're all wonderful. But if you've got an argument diagram, that's, that's your paragraph. These are your paragraphs if you're writing a quick, easy, thousand-word uh, essay. What's the topic sentence? Well, it's the one that's closest to the thesis. You've got one paragraph that's going to talk about making society safer. Your next paragraph's going to be talking about um, uh, saving money, and your final paragraph is going to be introducing the arguments against and then refuting them. That's it. If you've got a more difficult um, or, or a longer essay, you just simply split the paragraphs up higher. Perhaps you would have an entire section of an essay on making society safer, but one paragraph could just be on the deterrence factor. So that's how you, you can split it higher if you want to talk more about these things. So that's the first thing it helps us with. So when we want to turn, when we've got these students writing these diagrams, instantly we can fix their paragraphs. The next thing we can do, and this is where we get the help of information services, is that we can use these diagrams to identify areas for research. It's a, I don't know whether this is just a first semester problem, but when students are introduced to, say, a controversial topic and then to academic search engines, the first thing they do is they type in the question into an academic search engine. You type in, we should, should we introduce capital punishment into EBSCO? And it will give you 30,000 results. None of them will, will, they'll be loosely associated with your topic, but it'll be poor research. Whereas what we can do here is ask, well, what actually do we need to know? What kind of evidence do, do, do we need to use for this sort of argument? The first question I would ask is, does it act as a deterrent? Now, that's a better search. So what we have in Core 1 is that after students have prepared a diagram for their final essay topic, the library comes in and helps them do these sorts of searches. We need to find out whether it does act as a deterrent. How may, do criminals or potential criminals fear uh, death more than they do jail? How many people actually reoffend that we could <coughs> stop reoffending by killing them? How expensive is jail compared to uh, the death penalty? How many innocent people are killed? How low is the risk of um, making a mistake? And how many lives versus how many lost? They would be fantastic questions. And if you work out that they're true, they prove everything all the way to the thesis. But what you might find is that they don't end up being true. And what students often find is when they start to write an essay, they, they begin having a certain opinion and then change it. So, Another thing that this activity does is it encourages flexibility. So you might find the answer to the question, does it act as a deterrent, is no. And some of you already may have been thinking about that, um, that, that, that having cap that capital punishment doesn't actually appear to have a deterrent effect. And it's mainly because the answer to the question above is that people don't think about um, the potential punishments while they're committing a crime. It could be a crime of passion, or they just don't care, or they think they'll get away with it. Not many people may reoffend. You might discover that, and you might discover that the death penalty, having a death penalty, costs more than incarceration. So what research has shown is that all of your, all of your thinking until this point is actually quite dodgy, and that means that your main points are dodgy, so perhaps you should change your thesis. So if it's not supported, that's not a good argument. So the wonderful thing that you can use with, a, with an argument diagram is instantly you can just shuffle things around a little bit more and change things. We just add a knot. It doesn't make society safer because it doesn't reduce crime, because there's no evidence capital punishment deters crime, because minimal considerations before a punishment before committing the crime. 
It only stops reoffence in a few cases, and it doesn't save money because the death penalty costs more than incarceration because of a lengthened appeals process. This proves it's ineffective, and all we've done is just added a simple not to the thesis statement. So the point that I'm trying to make about flexibility here is that at the stage of argument diagramming, getting the idea in your head, there's no sunk costs. You might have had the situation where a student has been a thousand words into a two thousand word essay and they all of a sudden find out that they're wrong or they find out that they disagree with their original ideas. And I bet you that most students will decide to just push on and write another thousand words then go back to the beginning and write two thousand words on what is correct or what they actually believe. So this encourages flexibility, this encourages um, uh, writing what they actually think or writing what is actually correct. All right, the fourth way that um, these, these argument diagrams can, can help students is that I, I argue that they can improve speed of, of writing and quality of writing. So what I have students do in other activity is I have them uh, all as a class, we, we, we write together and we work out an argument um, for another controversial topic. The one from 152 that I used, and I, and I kept this down because it worked particularly well, uh, was, was arguing, and this was one of the paragraphs uh, arguing for uh, allowing abortion, and it's kind of argued negative, negatively. So what I then ask, once we've got this diagram on the board, like once you've got this diagram in front of you, I ask every single student, I want you to write, turn that into a paragraph. Here are your rules. If you jump upwards, you write because. So you would say we should allow abortion because not doing so would have neg negative consequences. If you want to start above, you just say, and, and go downwards, you just say because. And um, there's a greater chance of neglect, oh sorry, therefore, therefore a child may suffer. And in 10 minutes, and I've been doing this for, for, for seven years, um, in 10 minutes every single student in the classroom is able to produce a distinction, or around about a distinction level of writing. And that's not hyperbole, that's just the case. I have every single student in the room read it out. Just to prove my point, this is an ESL student from last semester. Now, you'll notice that there are, that the, the, the student struggles with, with, the English is not perfect. I'll, I'll read it to you. Uh, we should allow abortion because negative consequences can apply if we disallow abortion. Firstly, mothers would suffer physically and psychologically. If abortion is no longer allowed in the hospital, then Oh, there is a good chance that backyard abortion rate will increase sharply and this may cause physical health problems of mothers. For the reason that mothers are forced to carry unwanted children, they are more likely to uh, suffer psychologically. Secondly, children would suffer as well, da 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 da, da. Now, this is an ESL student who, who would normally struggle with, with writing on the spot without a, a word processing Kind of, kind of thing, and that's great. It's, it, it's well organised. It's what we would want, and, and, and it's on the spot. So this has implications for people who struggle in tests, who have to write a very quick, very sharp response to a particular type of question. I, what I encourage the students to do is just quickly sketch it out and get their thoughts in order before they even start writing. And the amount of time that they will save by doing the two activities is, is, is amazing compared to just trying to work it out on a bit of paper. Cool. Another thing we do is that we have students um, plan an extended essay. So I won't go in too much into detail of this, but one of the things that we torment them with in Core 1, um, just to really, really get them good at this sort of stuff, is we make them diagram their entire essay. This isn't perfect, but you can see how complicated it gets. And it's not that we ever really genuinely think that they'll do this again, um, because this can become painful. but we make them do it to a greater level so that it increases the potential that they might just sketch a little idea down. And it's the sketching stuff that does, um, has value. Now one of the things that, that, that I really like about um, argument diagramming is it allows us to check drafts. So the benefit of, of, of the power in the argument, of argument diagramming is you get to see immediately, you have deep insight into what a student is thinking and how they're trying to a, a, a approach a topic. And by doing that, you can talk through how they're approaching the topic. So you can see where they're going wrong and, and, and give advice for how to improve. So I'm going to give you, show you an actual example of a student who has, who, um, so one of the rules that we have in Core 1, and it's not because we're lazy, but if they want to talk to us about their essay, they need to show us a diagram. 
Now, it's not because we, we just don't want to talk to them, and we don't expect them to do something like this, um, but we just expect them to at least sketch out their thoughts. Now, that's so that we can see where they're, what they're thinking without them, and it saves a bunch of time, and it, we can give them better feedback. So here is a student, and this is real, um, who is writing on the topic and wants to write a case. It's very early. It's very early thinking. They want to write on the topic that we should, um, uh, we should force people to have a year of military service. Now, instantly, I know what this student, if this student goes to write this in an essay, it's going to, it's going to be terrible. And I can tell them right away why. So the first set of reasonings up here is she says that uh, we, we, should, we should have it because it increases people's physical skills because it increases their, improves their body composition because of weight loss and muscle mass. And I mean, yeah, but don't put that in your essay. Do you see what I mean? That's too simple. That's, that's not academic. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a side benefit. Not a, that's not a particularly, particularly convincing argument. Um, or, or at least it's, it's, it's implied by the fact that there will be physical benefits. Now, this person argues that reducing the number of crime rate will lead to job opportunities. Now, that's unclear. Um, they would need to argue for that or possibly abandon it. So what I would do is, in consultation with this student, is say, well, what are you saying? Or why do you think that um, it would decrease the crime rate? Uh, why would having people um, have military service increase the crime, uh, decrease the crime rate? Maybe it's because everyone's got a gun now. Like, what's she getting at? We would need to find out what her thinking is. Here she says that it, it creates a safer country, therefore a greater return in economic style I don't know what she's talking. What does she mean there? Um, and so I would ask her this. Well, what do you mean by that? And she would answer, and I'd be able to help. She then says, greater return in economic style. Because, uh, therefore, individuals are hardworking and independent. No, 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 no. She means that the other way around. Do you see? Down here at the bottom, I, I could argue, well, if she thinks that that's the arguments against having mandatory military service, um, well, she needs to really go back and consider the opposing case, because that's not it. So. Instantly, the student can walk away from a consultation knowing uh, what they need to work on, um, what they need to look into uh, before they put pen to paper. Because if this is their thinking, um, it, it's going to result in a poor essay. We also, so the seventh thing, seventh out of eighth, uh, thing we use um, these diagrams for is we actually, so call one links strongly with um, Beyond Bonds and, and, and the, the unfair advantage, which teaches how to write a quick essay, oh, sorry, a quick presentation. It's like a, it gives you three minutes of uh, preparation to write a persuasive essay. All we do is we just give them a handout like that. They already know how to write essay, uh, diagrams. That's how they can persuade us. The final way that argument diagrams help in Core 1 to teach critical thinking is that they give structure to discussions and debates. So, one way that we can actually, uh, a wonderful way that we can use argument diagrams to, to structure a discussion, you just split a class in half, give half of them one side of the topic and then the other half the other side of the topic. They have to write a diagram and then talk it back to the opposing side. So for example, here again we see the recurring theme of, of death penalty. One side is arguing that there shouldn't be one, the other side is arguing uh, that they should. Now, the next step is that they give this back to, um, so they present this to the class. And I've got a video here of one of the students um, actually talking through their team's argument uh, to the opposing side. It should not be a death penalty in Australia uh, because it has, uh, we're going to talk a, bit, a little bit about uh, foreign relations. Uh, outcome, if we had a death penalty, that sort of, uh, we might have different ideas or values to other countries. Uh, the Bali Nine is a good example of that. Um, uh, different laws, so uh, some countries might have uh, laws that elicit the death penalty, where in other countries it's totally fine to do those sort of things. Um, and that can affect foreign country relations, so there can be disagreements between countries and consequences, um, which can lead to emotional turmoil for families involved, um, which can have bad effects on relationships between families, between countries, which uh, leads to being that there should not be a death penalty. Um, also, yeah, I talked about repercussions on family, which leads to emotional turmoil and bad effects. So, yeah, that all works out. Um, so, humanitarian solutions. It is, uh, we're talking about how it's not necessarily the most humanitarian solution to kill someone. 
Um, so first of all, uh, control of humans. I don't think I was there when we wrote down that particular part. Um, so I'm not entirely sure. Uh, so basically, well, I think what, it, what we're trying to say here is that uh, you're having complete control over humans and their lives, uh, which is giving a large amount of power given to people uh, to actually kill people and decide who should live and who should die, uh, which uh, elicits the possibility of corruption, um, which can lead to innocent people being killed, people being killed for, uh, uh, you know, like ulterior motives and that sort of thing. Um, which is definitely not humanitarian, and which is why we should not have the death penalty. Um, again, uh, so up here we're talking about how uh, the death penalty, uh, it gives no sense of rehabilitation, so there's, it's basically saying that you're beyond being rehabilitated, you're beyond any sort of rede uh, redemption, uh, which means that this is sort of an old and barbaric, sort of archaic idea, uh, that people can't be redeemed, uh, more uh, which goes against the uh, more modern ethical values in which like, we sort of believe that people generally are a lot more redeemable. Like, there is usually some way that they can help out and uh, be a positive part of society. Uh, so that would be a more huma humanitarian solution. Uh, so again, there should not be death penalty. Again, uh, uh, having a death penalty induces an element of fear. So uh, a fear-based system goes against ethical values uh, which is not a humanitarian solution, and therefore there should not be a death penalty. So I'll hand it off to Simone. Cool. So I show you that example, um, not because it's perfect. Um, it, it, it isn't. Uh, and probably while you were watching that, you, you thought, oh, there's, a, there's some, some, some weak parts, there's some parts that are good, there's some parts that, that, that need work. But that's an example of a first attempt at trying to, to discuss a topic, and, and uh, I mean, he did that with a group, so it wasn't his own work, and he might have forgot what, what parts were important. So when, when we have a look at it, this is the, the power. It isn't that it will give you a right answer, but it kind of provides you a framework to discuss the argument. And it's not, it's not offensive. So what you will often find in classroom discussions is that when some people line up on one side of a debate, and if someone says something against them, uh, they'll feel hurt. And, and whereas this gives you an ability to kind of point at, and you're not saying that, it's, that he was wrong, but you would argue that there's opportunities to improve uh, his, his argument. So for example, when, when the main point of his argument that we should ha uh, not have a death penalty is that there's bad effects on relationships, well, I find that vague and you can criticize it with that and the other side will. I thought, and you may have had this feeling as well when you were listening to him explain that, that, that it was illicit to put together or to run together, and I see kind of what he was doing, uh, international relations and familial relations. That didn't, that didn't really kind of go together. There, it was not clear how there would be repercussions for a family and he would need to explain that, um, but my, my suggestion would be to remove that part, um, that, that, the, that the distinction between country, uh, the, the, the problems that it would cause between countries that do and do not have it would be enough to, to make his point. Um, he argued positively for improving humanity, but what he really meant to probably say there would be inhumane and that would make things a lot clearer. He didn't really need to give the, the reason at the top for control of humans, and he seemed to back away from it when he was describing it himself. But you may have felt that the final section where he was talking about, uh, that was that was his best section. And you could feel that as well. Um, you, you could see that that was his strongest argument. And then the other side, the opposing side who's listening to this would be worried. They would say, I, could, I can beat you on that. I can beat you on that. Um, but, but, but we don't have anything against that. Or at least we'd have to think harder for a refutation against that. So what I've actually done as well, if you want a bit more blood in the classroom, but not, not too much, uh, is there's another way that you can run a debate, and I'll get Dan to hand out a kind of a lesson plan here. So I'll quickly describe it as he's handing it out, but there's, there's detailed examples here. Rather than have them kind of discuss it to each other or present the, the case back to the class, um, you give them one side gets a blue pen, the other side gets a red pen, and then you let them add one reason at a time, and they get to attack the other side's reason, and it's a whole bunch of fun. It ends up with this it was a beautiful mess 
on a whiteboard, uh, which you can then talk about at the end, kind of maybe who won or who has the stronger case or what, more, what things do we need to look at. So I encourage you, if you have debates or if you've been thinking about having debates in the class, to, to follow that activity. It's, it's, it, it works really, really well. So th those are the eight ways that we use uh, diagramming in Core 1 to, to enhance critical thinking. I hope that that's um, kind of it, uh, that you've thought about ways that you could use that in your class. Now, in terms of taking things further, so you might think that this is a bit simplistic and uh, a little bit below the abilities of your students. And that might be the case. So by the time they, they, they exit Core 1, they at least should be familiar with this. So there are ways to take it further. One example would be to, uh, particularly for um, in, in, the, in the law areas, would be to look at Toolman diagramming. Um, you could actually give them the name of the particular types of, um, of parts of an argument. But one way that we're actually kind of taking things a little bit further is in Core 3. Uh, so what we're do, or what Core 3 does is sacrifices a bit of the speed and simplicity to go into a particular type of depth. So remember, recall back to the, the argument diagram for the, the death penalty. What I said at the beginning was that this activity doesn't represent every single proposition or statement that's active within an argument. And one thing we can do is actually make those unstated propositions um, explicit. So here we have this argument. Now, the only way that the dark blue reasons at the bottom, um, it will make society safer and it will save money, can prove the, the the thesis is from a missing premise. And that missing premise is telling. So for example, you might agree that the death penalty would save money, but that doesn't mean you have to accept that we should introduce it. So something's missing. And what they are are these wonderful uh, principles, moral principles in this case. The first one is that we should do anything that makes society safe. Now, if it is true that the death penalty will make society safe, and it is also true that we should do anything that makes society safe, then the conclusion that we should introduce it follows. But they haven't said that. And once you point that out to a student and you say, okay, so you're committed to the idea that we should do anything to make society safe, think about the rich discussion that will come from that. They'll say, well, not anything, and not in these cases, or only in these cases, and only for these reasons. The other un, uh, sort of suppressed um, ethical principle for the money thing is we should always do the things that save money. So instantly when you take things just a little bit further, you can challenge these unstated premises, these, um, and in these cases, these are, these are principles. Compare them to other principles. Perhaps the important thing about having a death penalty or not isn't money, but rather is um, a liberty or something like that, or safety versus liberty, that sort of thing, and argue about the relevance in this case. So that is an entire core subject. Uh, we don't have time to do that. Uh, there's, there's many things I'd love to do in Core 1 that we just don't have time to do. So that's, we, we hand that over to Core 3 and that's their MO. That's what they deal with. They are interested in, in, in ethical principles and their application. So it's a, it provides a wonderful continuity because what we do in Core 1 is we give everyone for their final essay a normative question. So, uh, sorry, a normative topic is just one that um, has a should in it. Should we have the death penalty, should we legalise marijuana, should we um, allow abortion, should we have uh, mandatory military service. Now all of these, in order to prove that, will need a, a use of an ethical principle. So in Core 3, what students will actually do is go back to their Core 1 assignment where they've argued, um, yes, we should have capital punishment or yes, we should have mandatory military service, and analyse how they've applied those principles. So there's a wonderful continuity there. And what I'd what I would like is that the continuity would exist between other subjects as well, and not just the core program. So let me conclude. Uh, argument diagramming is a powerful teaching tool because it helps students represent and organise their thinking. It provides the framework for constructive feedback and is useful for a wide range of academic activities. Furthermore, all Bond University students are familiar with argument diagramming, therefore we're in a unique position to build upon common abilities. Therefore, I encourage other teachers to use it 
as well. Uh, thank you. Cheers.